Okay, we have gone through a lot of material and we still are probably only halfway through Revelation. So I thought it would be a good time to take time out. I should have done this uh, long before now. But let's just kind of go through very quickly what we've gone through so far. So let's call it a refresher, an overview of the story so far, at least up to the seventh seal. So we started at the very beginning of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where he said, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, which is very contrary to a lot of beliefs out there in the Christian world. But Jesus says, I came, what? To fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, which means until the end of times, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So if we want to understand Revelation uh, and, and uh, get a grasp on how to interpret, we have to keep in mind, first and foremost, that in the Law and the Prophets, everything must be accomplished. This is why Jesus said in, in John 5, 46, if you believe in Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So this is so crucial and fundamental, and it's the reason why we've gone deep into um, the Law and the Prophets in this course. So then from there, we, we started with verse 1 of Revelation, which uh, we, uh, first of all, the first question was, uh, some versions say the revelation of Jesus Christ. Other translations say the revelation from Jesus Christ. So which is it? Is it from or is it of? We went and looked at the original language and then found out there is no such thing as of in the Greek language. It's up to the interpreter to decide. The literal Greek translation is Revelation, Jesus Christ. And so often the original language is so important because it will give us the complete picture. The complete picture is what? The revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation from Jesus Christ. So in answer to the question, is it of or from? The answer is yes, it's both. And that's that way intentionally which God gave him, Jesus, to show to his bondservants, those who uh, are freely and voluntarily uh, serving the Lord uh, in church, um, the things which must soon take place. So this is very, very important. And then from there, we went into the name of Jesus Christ, because is his name really Jesus? No, that's not the name that was given to him. It was Yeshua, which the Greeks transliterated into uh, Iesus, uh, because they could not, uh, the Greek language did not have that way of uh, pronunciation. And then the English translation started off with Isus. Uh, that was the first King James. And uh, the Geneva Bible uh, uses a J instead of an I. And so it was Isus in their language, but Jesus in uh, the English tongue. And that stuck even in later versions of the King James. So, uh, Jesus Christ, Christ is Mashiach, the Hebrew for anointed one or the Messiah. Uh, now, that was translated uh, into Greek, Christos, which is anointed one, but then uh, English translators chose not to translate Mashiach or Christos, but they decided to transliterate. So Christos became Christ. So Jesus Christ is originally Yeshua HaMashiach in, in Hebrew. Now, why do I make a big deal of this? Well, names are important. Names are important to God. Names are important in Scripture, and names should be important for us. And the name Yeshua is all over the Old Testament, not as a name, but as the word salvation. And all that you see on the screen there is, uh, in bold, is Yeshua translated as salvation. And I'll just uh, pick one, uh, second to last, Isaiah 12, 2. Surely God is my Yeshua, my salvation. 
I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my Yeshua, my salvation. And with joy, you will draw water from the wells of Yeshua, the wells of living water, the wells of salvation. So this is why we make such a big deal to know and understand the proper name of, of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. His name is salvation, Yeshua. And I believe that's very, very important. And also on that note, what about the name of God the Father? God the Father, believe it or not, shared his own name with us in Scripture 6,829 times. However, because Jewish religious leaders chose not to speak his name because they did not want to use his name in vain, so if we don't say his name, then we obviously can't use his name in vain. Well, that's pretty wrong thinking. But anyway, because of that, and because ancient Hebrew does not have vowels, uh, modern Hebrew does, they're called nikuds, uh, nobody knows how to pronounce his name. Uh, we only have the consonants. And uh, two of the, uh, the possible pronunciations that most uh, theologians will kind of agree on is either Yahweh or Yehovah. And um, I chose Yahweh. Uh, which just means he was, he is causing to become, or will cause to become, because God shared his name with us. And I feel like that that, that level of intimacy with God the Father uh, should not be discounted. Uh, the Bible translate YHWH as Lord all caps, at least most translations are. Uh, but Lord all caps is not a name. It's just a title. The Jewish people today, they either say Hashem, which means the name, or Adonai, which means my Lord or my master. Once again, it's not his name. It's just a title. And New Testament Greek didn't even try. They just used Kurios, which is a title for master, God, Lord, or sir. So every time we come across God's name in Old Testament scripture that we refer to, which is in all caps, L-O-R-D, not capital L, lowercase O-R-D, that's usually ad and I. So every time we hit that all caps, quite often I will use his name just to help us understand how personal our God was, um, is to us, and was uh, to his people. So having said that, now, going back to Revelation chapter 1, uh, we also should look at, uh, we looked at verse 3, because this is such a unique verse. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. This is the only book in the Bible that says, blessed is the one who reads aloud. And blessed are the hearers, uh, the complete Jerusalem Bible, Jewish Bible, sorry, says, provided they obey. NIV says, and take to heart. So, I mean, not only do we need to hear it, but we need to apply it in our lives. Why? Because the time is near. Okay, now having said all that, we looked at the gospel. What is the basic gospel message that was preached in the New Testament? Well, what did John the Baptist say? He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, I must proclaim the gospel, the good news of what? Of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. I mean, we really need to take this to heart. The gospel is the coming kingdom of God. Uh, what did Jesus tell his disciples? He sent them out to what? To proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. What did Apostle Paul proclaim? He proclaimed in Acts 28, the kingdom of God and taught all about Lord Jesus Christ because he's the only way to the kingdom. Uh, so that does not discount what D Jesus did on, died on the cross. That bought us salvation. That bought us citizenship into his kingdom. But the good news is not that we die and go to heaven. The good news is that we die. We may go to heaven in the meantime, but there's going to be a restored 
heaven and earth, and that is going to be God's kingdom. And we will be fellow citizens, part of his family in his kingdom. So it's a very, very important uh, part of the New Testament. So having said that, then we went all the way back to the beginning, to God's kingdom that God created. And verse uh, chapter 126, where God says, let us make mankind in our image after they created everything else but us in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock and wild animals and over all the creatures that move on the earth. That's what mankind was commissioned with. And God created us what? In his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created us. And God blessed us and said to us to be fruitful and increase in number, to fill the earth and to subdue it. And once again, to rule over the fish and the birds and every living creature that moves on the ground. Very, very important. But there's more to it. Chapter 2, verse 18 and 22. The Lord... Yahweh said, it's not good for the man to be alone, and I will make a helper suitable for him. And then Yahweh made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. We've got to remember scripture is there for a reason and a purpose. And what, there's, what's the meaning behind this? What's the, the takeaway? The takeaway is that man should not live alone. God does not want to live alone either. He created us to have fellowship with him. So very, very important. And then obviously it was all very good. That was the original God's kingdom. And God prepared a special place for us, uh, the Garden of Eden. He would come down and visit man in the evening. However, we know how the story ends. Because Yahweh, uh, well, no, because, because Eve took the forbidden fruit and God came down and he made these following three proclamations. So very fundamental and important and helps us to understand God's plan for man and God's heart. So what did he say to the serpent? Yahweh God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you, Satan. Cursed are you, serpent, uh, above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. So God personally cursed Satan. What did God say to man? Uh, first and foremost, Adam took the blame, not Eve, rightly so. Uh, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. What did he say? Cursed is the ground because of you. Cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. Not cursed are you, Adam. Big, big difference. And through painful toil, you eat food from it all the days of your life. And then in between those verses is this monumental prophecy of how it's all going to end. Genesis 3, 15, where God says, I will put enmity between you, he's talking to the serpent, and the woman, not Adam, the woman, <clears throat> and between your offspring, Satan, and her offspring, her seed. Well, that doesn't even make sense, right? At least biologically. And then he says, he, so we know it's going to be a he, not a she, even though it's the seed of a woman. He will crush your head, Satan, and you will strike his heel, which was fulfilled on the cross when Jesus Christ was crucified. And then in Old Testament, we see this main uh, thread, a prophetic uh, thread being woven throughout scripture that he 
He being the seed of the woman is going to come from the line of Abraham. And all this was kind of pronounced in the Abrahamic covenant. He, the seed of the woman, is going to come from the line of Judah. He, the seed of the woman, is going to come from the line of David, uh, where God says, uh, uh, Yahweh says, uh, when your days are over, talking to David, and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one. He is the seed of the woman, is the one who will build the house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He will be my son. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is so monumental and so important. And then he goes on in, later in Psalms where he says... Uh, uh, the kings of the earth rise up and rulers band together against Yahweh, against his anointed, against his Mashiach or Messiah, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, what? I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. So, his king is the seed of the woman. They'll be installed on Zion in Jerusalem, but Zion is so much more than that. It's also the temple, uh, which, um, which we'll talk about later. So, the Abrahamic covenant is fundamental to understanding God's plan for man and, and that is being uh, culminated and, and unfolded in Revelation. And where in Genesis 17, uh, 7, he says, I, Yahweh, will establish my covenant as what? An everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. Uh, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Um, and uh, it's just reiterated in Psalms 105, where uh, he talks about uh, to the descendants of Abraham and his chosen ones, he remembers his covenant forever. The promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac, he confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you, to you, my chosen I will give the land of Canaan as a portion you will inherit. So very, very important. So then from there, we kind of uh, uh, jumped forward into Exodus. And um, in Exodus chapter 6, something very, very important happens where God is talking to Moses and he tells Moses uh, to, to be his mouthpiece, right? So... He says, therefore say to the Israelites, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I, listen to this, I will redeem you. Whoa. With an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment, I will take you. That's a very important word. If you go to the original Hebrew, it's leka, to take, which means to take a woman, to marry as a wife. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. You see a common theme here? And then you will know that I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So, we know how the story goes. 
uh, Lord using uh, Moses and Aaron exercised judgments against Pharaoh's kingdom. Uh, there were 12 judgments, uh, everything from turning the staff to a snake to the Red Sea being the final judgment of escape and deliverance. But one thing that's important in all this is also to note the Goshen principle and Passover. Very, very important to help us understand Revelation. So what was the Goshen principle? The Goshen principle was Goshen was where uh, the Israelites lived. So they commuted to work, right? So they would commute and build bricks and whatever else they were doing as slaves. And then at night they would go back in Goshen where when God's judgments were being uh, pronounced against Egypt and Pharaoh, nothing was happening in Goshen. In Exodus chapter 8, uh, there was no swarms of flies in Goshen while there were in Egypt. In chapter 9, there was no devastating hail in Goshen while there was in Egypt. In chapter 10, there was no darkness in Goshen while in Egypt. There was darkness for three days, darkness that could be felt. So it's a very, very important principle. The other important principle is what? The Passover. This is huge. This is monumental. This is such a big theme in Revelation is the whole principle behind Passover about innocent blood purchasing atonement for sins. In Exodus uh, where 12.12, uh, 12, he says, where well, I will pass through Egypt. I, Yahweh, will pass through Egypt. And I, Yahweh, will strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I, Yahweh, will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am Yahweh. The blood will be a sign, a sign for you on the houses you are, where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And then after all that was said and done, he says, this is so important. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to Yahweh as a lasting ordinance. This is important to us. This is important to God. What did Jesus say when he celebrated uh, the Lord's Supper? The Lord's Supper, by the way, was the a Passover dinner that he celebrated uh, not only with his uh, disciples, but if you recall, we talked about that there was actually two Passovers, one that he could, he could uh, share uh, uh, with the Passover Supper and the other that he could actually be the Passover lamb, okay? Uh, and in Luke, uh, it's so important here. It says, when the hour came, he reclined at the table, the apostles with him, and he said to them, what? I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, and listen carefully, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And that will be Passover fulfilled. Remember, Jesus Christ came <clears throat> to fulfill the law and the prophets. And then, of course, we know, I mean, we know what happened at the Red Sea and Pharaoh's men uh, all died, and then God led them to where? to Mount Sinai. Now, previously in Exodus 6, God says, I will take you, Lika, to like to marry you as a, as a wife, as my own people, and I will be your God. Well, that conversation is not over with yet. Now, in Exodus 19, at the foot of Mount Sinai, he says this, now, if you obey me fully, and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, out of all nations, because I created them, out of all mankind, you will be my treasured possession. An amazing proposal. Uh, but when you stop and think about it, 
choosing one of the many is exactly what a man does when he chooses a wife. When I chose my wife, she is she became and she said yes, she became what? My treasured possession. And although the old the whole earth is mine, says the Lord, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Extremely intimate. This is God's love for man. So, uh, this covenant has now been revised because the children of Israel said, yes, we will accept. So this is now betrothal, right? And a, a biblical betrothal is a legally binding first phase of the marriage covenant. And biblical marriage ceremony includes the mikveh, which is a ceremonial washing of the bride before the ceremony, the chupa, which is the canopy, that uh, the bride and groom stand under to read and sign their vows, which is the ketubah. The ketubah is a legally binding contract that contains the obligations of the bride and the obligations of the groom. And then all that is followed with what? Celebration in the wedding banquet. So, did we have this at Mount Sinai? The answer is an emphatic yes. Uh, on uh, uh, Yahweh said to Moses, go to the people and concentrate, consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Them is the bride washing their clothes. That's the mikveh. That's the washing of the bride. And then he will come down on Mount Sinai um, on the third day in, in front of all the people. Then... A few verses later, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with what? A thick cloud that, that, that was over the mountain, that covered the mountain. It was a canopy of a thick cloud, thick cloud over the mountain. That's the chupa, the, can, the canopy. And it was with a loud trumpet blast. And, of course, everybody was quite fearful of what was happening. Um, and then Yahweh descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called to Moses to the top of the mountain and God spoke all these words which are the Ten Commandments. Right? You shall have no other gods before me. I liked, um, I can't remember, it was like number five or so, where it says, remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. The seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh, your God. So this is almost like date night uh, uh, with, with uh, the bride's husband. So, what happened then? The banquet, the wedding feast, and Moses, Aaron, uh, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 elders, they went up Mount Sinai. They saw the God of Israel. And uh, then it describes under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sky, but God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, they ate, and they drank. And then after that, God calls Moses up and says, uh, um, come to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone. With what? The ketubah, the law and the commandments I've written. So Moses went up for 40 days and 40 nights, and then we know what happened. Uh, the bride had wandering eyes and became the adulterous bride and resurrected a golden calf. And as we see here, Yahweh said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. And he used a very, very vile word for corrupt. Corrupt like as mankind in the days of Noah. Corrupt as like uh, the, the, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Moses went down. He called for help. The Levites rallied to him and he told them, strap on your swords, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other. Kill your brothers, your friends, your neighbors. And the Levites did as Moses commanded. And about 3,000 people died. Also as a result of that, the Levites, the tribe of Levi became the Levitical priesthood um, for the tabernacle and for the temple of God. 
So, in spite of all this, if God had been a man, a human, he would have, that would have been it. That's it. Uh, we will go our separate ways, and um, I hope we never meet again. But that's not the heart of God. In fact, even just immediately after this, uh, when he passed in front of uh, Moses in Exodus 34, he says, Yahweh, the compassionate, the gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. So this is after all that had happened. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. So there was already, he was telling Moses in advance, there's more to this. I, I still will honor my covenant. I still will redeem my people. But yet it says he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And he says uh, in Leviticus, he says, if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors, so this is generations later, um, uh, or at least a couple generations later, their unfaithfulness and their hostility toward me, which made me hostile towards them, so that I sent them into the land of their enemies then, not when, then, not if, sorry, not if, then, when, their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sins because I'm not going to leave the guilty unpunished. I will remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land which I promised them. I will not reject them or abhor them so as to destroy them completely, meaning there is going to be a certain mount of the population that will be destroyed, breaking my covenant with them. I am Yahweh their God, but for their sake, I will remember the covenant with their ancestors whom I brought out of Egypt in the sight of nations to be their God. That common phrase there, that common promise, I am Yahweh. And so this is so fundamental and understanding what's going on in the book of Revelation and why. Why? And there's more to this story. So throughout now, the rest of Scripture, uh, in particular the Old Testament and the prophets, uh, we see this reoccurring theme from God, his anger at what the children of Israel did, uh, the pain of rejection, but also his heart of, of keeping uh, the door open for repentance and return. Uh, Hosea is a good example where Yahweh instructed Hosea to what? To go marry a whore, a promiscuous woman, have children with her, because I want you to understand the pain that I, the Lord, am suffering. But then he says, I will punish her for the day she burned incense to the bowels and decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after lovers. But me, Yahweh, she forgot declares Yahweh, therefore, therefore what? Listen to this. I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness. I will speak tenderly to her. There she will respond as the days of her youth, as the day when she came up out of Egypt, when she was saying, yes, Lord, yes. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, that day is going to be the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, uh, declares Yahweh, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice and love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge Yahweh. And when we read about in Revelation 12, the woman fled into the wilderness, the woman being Israel, to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of, for 1,260 days, three and a half years, 
we need to go back and read Hosea. We also need to go back and read Isaiah, which also help us understand God's pain and anger and his heart, where he says in 54, 5, for your maker is what? Your husband. Yahweh Almighty is his name, the Holy One of Israel. You are Israel, is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. Because remember, I'm going to make you my treasured possession. Yahweh will call you back as if you were a wife deserted in distress in spirit, a wife who married young only to be rejected. And for a brief moment, I abandoned you. But with deep compassion, I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says Yahweh, your Redeemer. Later in 62, verse 4, he says, No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, for Yahweh will take delight in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young bride, so will your builder marry you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. So will God rejoice over you. This is God's heart, and this is the story of mankind. However, okay, we're saying, well, okay, that's good for um, the Jewish people, the Hebrews, Israel. What about us that are not? You know, the, us Gentiles. Well, that has always been there as well. Genesis twenty-two eighteen. 18. We're going to go back to the Abrahamic covenant because this is so important. Where Yahweh says to Abraham, and through your offspring, your offspring being the, the Jewish people, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And so then we find out that there's a plan for the Gentiles and the plan is not fulfilled until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Uh, if, let me just read two verses, uh, scriptures, first from Romans 11. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part. Why? Until the full number of Gentiles come in. You and me that are not part of, of uh, the Jewish ancestry. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as is written. The deliverer will come from Zion, from Jerusalem, and he will turn godless, godlessness away from Jacob which is also another very big hint in all this. Uh, Ephesians 3, 6, the mystery that through the gospel, remember what the gospel is, you're the coming kingdom of God and Jesus Christ being the way to the kingdom. The Gentiles, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, shares together in the promises of Christ Jesus. Remember what Jesus said, salvation is from the Jews. Well, salvation from all is from the Jews. That was explained in Galatians 3 by the Apostle Paul, where he says scripture, that being Old Testament back then, foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles. How? By faith. And he announced the gospel in advance to Abraham, where he says what? All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith in our Lord Jesus Christ are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Ephesians, I'll hit this real, I mean, all of Ephesians is so rich, but let me just hit Ephesians 2, uh, starting in verse 11. You who are Gentiles by birth, called uncircumcised, remember that time you were what? Separate from Christ. You were separate from the Messiah. He was not part of your life. Excluded what? From citizenship in Israel. Excluded what? You were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. 
And these are heavy hitting covenants. You were without hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near. How? By the blood of of Messiah, the Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made what? The two groups, the Jew and Gentile, into one. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them, Jew and Gentile, to God through the cross. So consequently, you, you and me, uh, who are Gentiles are no longer what? Foreigners. We're no longer strangers. But we are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise, God's promise, that is found in Christ Jesus, in Yeshua, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. This is God's plan for mankind. Thank you, Lord God. And with all of this, there was a new covenant that was explained to Israel by the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Ezekiel said several, therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Yahweh says, it's not for your sake. I'm going to do these things, but it's for the sake of my holy name. And then he goes on later, he says, For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your land. I will sprinkle you clean. I will sprinkle clean water on you. That's the, remember the McVeigh. You will be clean. I will cleanse you. That's the reason why you'll be clean, because I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart. I will put in you a new, new spirit. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land that I gave your ancestors all of Canaan, not just Israel that we see today. You will be my people, and I will be your God. Jeremiah also said, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand, I led them out of Egypt, because why? They broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people, my most treasured possession. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, No, Yahweh, because they will all know me. For I will forgive their wickedness, and will remember their sins no more. And then that's explained in Hebrews chapter 9 that Jesus Christ is going to be the mediator for all this uh, of the new covenant, that those who are called, that being the elect, the Gentiles, as well as the Jews, the, which will be a, a remnant of them, may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So there's, so the, in one sense, the, the kingdom of God is a two-phase plan, right? Phase one was Jesus Christ coming on earth, dying for our sins, and then the second phase is him coming back uh, uh, with the new covenant uh, to redeem, uh, to, um, to eradicate all sin and evil. So that was one very important main line of prophecy, the seed of the woman and what the seed of the woman is going to achieve and accomplish. Well, there's another main line of prophecy, and that is Yahweh the cloud rider. Um, and um, in um, Deuteronomy 33 and 32, uh, I mean, correction, 33, which is the song of Moses before the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River. 
where he says, Yahweh came with myriads of holy ones at your feet. They all bow down and you receive instruction, the law that Moses gave us. Um, okay, well, it's like, okay, that's historical, right? Because we've already read about that. That happened in the Lord came. That happened in Mount Sinai. But this is where it's so important to go back to the original language. We go back to the original language and the word that's translated as came is written in perfect tense and perfect tense can be translated as past as present or as future so to translate this properly and and so often translators will go well okay he's talking about the sinai experience so we'll use cain well it's much much more than that yahweh came yahweh is coming yahweh will come from Sinai. He came, he is coming, and he will come with myriads of holy ones, which obviously did not happen at Mount Sinai. And at your feet they all bow down, and from you receive instruction. The law that Moses gave us, the possession of the assembly of, of Jacob, he was king over Jeshron, which is Egypt, I mean, correction, which is Israel, when the, when the leaders of the people assembled along with the tribes of Israel. Um, the second passage in uh, Deuteronomy uh, is, there is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides across the heavens to help you on the clouds in his majesty. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he will drive out your enemies. So, um, then also in Psalms, uh, we read more about the cloud rider, that the Lord is going to ride the clouds to rescue his people. May God arise. May his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke as, melt, as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God. Well, obviously this has not happened yet. But then he goes on to say, but may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful, sing to God, sing in praise of his name, which we're going to read about in Revelation. Extol him who? Who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is Yahweh. And then we read later on, just a few verses later in the same chapter of Psalms. Surely God will crush the heads of his enemies. Now, wait a minute crush the heads of his enemies. That's going all the way back now to Genesis 3.15. I thought it was going to be the seed of the woman that crushes the head of Satan. Now we're reading here, God will crush the heads of his enemies, the hairy crowns of those who go on in their sins. So what is it? And the Lord says, I will, I will bring them from Bashan, and I will bring them from the depths of the sea, that your feet may wade in the blood of your foes, while the tongues of your dogs have their share. So, who is the seed of the woman? Um, and then we read in Daniel 7, where he says, In my vision at night I looked, and before me was like one like the Son of Man. Okay, yeah. Coming with the clouds of heaven. Wait a minute. That's the cloud rider. So who's the cloud rider? And he approached the Ancient of Days. Well, that would be Yahweh. He was led into his presence, into his throne room of God. He was given. He, the cloud rider, uh, the Son of Man, was given authority, glory, sovereign power, and all nations and peoples of every language worshipped who? Him. Who's him? The Son of Man, the Cloud Rider, the Messiah. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So now God is unfolding more and more of his plan through the prophet uh, Daniel that there is a Messiah, and he is the Cloud Rider. And he will be given glory and sovereign power. And he will be worshipped. Now, wait a minute. We say, uh, worship God, worship God alone. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Yes, that's true. There's much more to one God than just what is 
in English. There's only one God, and he is Yahweh, and he is Yeshua, and he is the Holy Spirit. So, um, that takes us halfway into uh, this session, and so I'm going to break this up into two sessions, and uh, starting the next session, we'll start uh, back in to Revelation uh, chapter 1 and verse 2.